Hello, I'm John Chivaco, the co-chair of the NIGEO 2023 conference and a board member of the New York Geothermal Energy Organization. I'd like to welcome you to this recording of a live presentation from the conference, a two-day event which was held in Albany, New York on April 26th and 27th of 2023. This year's educational sessions and keynotes represent the latest in ground source heat pump system design, product innovations, and installation practices, along with important policy, regulatory, financing, and incentive updates. This presentation is one of over 40 sessions from the two-day event, all of which were recorded and available at NIGEO's website, www.ny-geo.org along with session descriptions and a link to download the slides from each of the sessions presented. NIGEO is proud to make this content available to our members and other industry stakeholders. And if you are a member, thanks so much for your support and participation. If you find this content valuable and for some odd reason, you are not yet a member, consider joining NIGEO at the appropriate membership level with details available at our website. The live recording from the NIGEO 2023 conference will start in just a moment. Thanks so much for listening. All right, welcome, welcome to the panel on measuring success, the data we need. This is one that is dear to my heart and I think is critical for the entire industry, but to, here in this track, we're focusing on um, thermal energy networks or geothermal networks. Um, and the data for those. So I'm turning it over uh, to Angie Alberto Escobar of HEAT to moderate the panel. Thank you all. Hi everyone, thanks for being here. I'm Angie Alberto Escobar and I am the director of our guest to geo transition at HEAT, which is a big task. <laughs> This session is titled, The Data We Need. I don't think there's any debate among us that our decisions moving forward should be data-based. And yet, when you get in the weeds of which data and what is most needed, the whole thing becomes a lot more complex. Uh, the answers are held not only by the panel, but in the audience here, I hope, today. We will have uh, brief presentations of existing and future case studies of ambient bi-directional district heating and cooling systems or network geothermal or one of the many other names. <laughs> uh, that will be followed by a workshopping session where audience participation is strongly encouraged. So presenters, please be mindful of time. We ask you to keep it to five minutes, okay. Um, so at HEAT, we believe that we need the wisdom of everyone. Collective intelligence breeds innovation, which we'll need to some degree to accomplish the goals we have. We hope to have everyone's engagement in this process in understanding the data we need in order to move forward, to optimize performance, cost, and to avoid unintended consequences. Uh, we will begin by examining all the information we get here today in this session, but also the rest of today's network geothermal track to help guide us forward. Um, and I wanna mention that all materials presented will be available online on an open source resource, gas2geo.wiki. If you stop by our booth, you might have seen the QR code, gas2geo.wiki. Uh, please go and contribute uh, to begin the knowledge transfer. So welcome panelists, thank you so much for being here. We have panelists with installs in the ground, uh, operational for years. Mm -hmm. And we have panelists here today that will be putting systems in the ground somewhat soon. Okay, so now I'm gonna turn it to each one of you for a high level overview. And again, we're not doing deep dives. I think we've, we've gotten many of those. <laughs> we're looking to support the sharing of case studies, of your case studies, Maybe you all in the audience also have case studies um, with standardized metrics. That's the, the focus. So, um, Carrie. 
Do you want to no. come on up? <laughs> okay. Thank you. What do we got here? Okay. Really, I think what, what I was told this was about was gathering information and how we organize it and what we do it and the importance thereof. It's, we've tried to do this before. And in ASHRAE, we tried to do it and we're not successful. Uh, you know, in AE, we've tried to do it and we're not been successful. And I'm hoping that maybe under this uh, uh, banner, in the heat banner, that we might be, because I think they're driven. And the girls and the whole people for the heat organization have done a wonderful job, both uh, locally and nationally. So I'm in full support of what we do. So I'm gonna talk about the district loops or just the fact that we got and in these ambient temperature loops we're talking about, but it also translates to any other type of district system. And the particular topic mm -hmm. is district systems and information we need to accomplish and uh, hold there. You know, first of all, you need some sort of an idea of what the system looks like. And, you know, I, they told me don't put anything complicated, make it a cartoon. Well, I'm sorry, I'm gonna give you the real data and have a, have a look at it because I think it, it makes more sense when I start to talk about a campus layout. What I've done is we've taken a campus, it's Colorado Macy University, and it's gonna really kind of our flagship property, a little bit 4,000 tons, uh, and it has been progressively built in, uh, since 2007. We started up with three buildings and about 2,300 students, and we're now at 11,500 students today and 17 buildings on the system with nine more buildings being put on. The state of Colorado just gave us $9 million to, com to what they call complete the first stage of our loop. Our total loop package costs about $20 million. I think that's a good piece of information. All the information I've seen on the ponds that are going through today, I'm looking at $20 million for a 330, or I'm sorry, a 300 ton system. I got a 3,000 ton system here happens to be one owner, but the cost is 20 million. And it's, that's a real cost as we go through. It's obviously gonna be higher if we try to put it in the city or so forth. It's a one, you know, one site operation. But the general idea is we are literally order of, order of magnitude off when we're taking, like, taking a look at the pricing on these district systems there. We have a lot of people who have never done it before. And to tell you the truth, there's probably only two groups that have really done this. That's Brian's group and our group. And so we're, we're interested in seeing how we collect this information. But what I'm showing here here is she wanted to know how I pumped it. Well, we can pump this district. We've got three pumps in parallel. It's a big deal. But I need to know that as we go through and stuff. And I've got a second brace. I've got pumps in parallel and I've got pumps in series. So I'm sustaining, it's an ultra low head system. Typically, I run nine horsepower to 10 horsepower to circulate three and a half miles of the 18 inch pipe line. I need to know that. And we need to just turn around and we, if we're gonna evaluate both the economics, ROIs, and efficiency and effectiveness of these systems, we gotta start to, start to have comparable data that we can play with. So what I've done is I've just circled the micro districts. You can see that they have, we can pump the whole thing all by itself. It doesn't matter, that's not the point. The point is, is we got to have some sort of description of the system, where we're going with it and what we're gonna do with it. So they asked me to start to come up and look and the first uh, uh, sheet that Angie gave me was a list of who owns the system, what climate zone it's in, the size in tons, and we've got 3,500 to 4,000 tons, where it's climate zone 6B. Okay, we have 558 heating degree days, and cooling degree days. That immediately gives me a distribution of, of energy, what I'm looking for and what's thing. But it only gives me the peaks. How long are the durations? But the durations determine my thermal storage and how much thermal storage I need. 
So it's kind of interesting. And then the direction and the utility where we're able to use the distributed energy, ID, uh, combined heating and cooling, and stuff. This is an all important, important data. How much conditioned space have I got? Well, I've got 1.3 1 1 million square feet. I've got 17 buildings. That turns around and gives me a size and a, and a magnitude and a thought or idea. It's a college campus, so it's going to be distributed. I'm going to have dorms. I'm going to have all kinds of buildings. Who owns this system? Well, this one's owned by the state of Colorado. Backup thermal sources. Everything is a backup thermal source in this system because we use incremental plug-and-play devices that we put on at the right time, the right place, to turn around and do the right job. We keep this system, we have no interference in the system. By the way, it doesn't ask that, but it does ask glycol of water. So the point thing is, I'm running this whole system with a heating and cooling degree days that I'm showing, five to 5,500 heating degree, day, degree days, and so forth. I'm using water, no antifreeze in the system. By the way, we should have system volume right there because the volume of the system is, is a little over 250,000 gallons. It's its own storage system, among other things. So how much did it cost to build? That's real important because it starts to give us a metric about what it means when we see a pond or we see a program or peer review uh, a program or a thing. If I see that the guy's putting in 300 tons and it's costing 20 million, there's something wrong. Okay, we, we've done something. We've padded our nest more times than we need to. And stuff, and when we start to look at whether we're using thermal storage or source sink for the boreholes, it's a big deal. Retrofitted new buildings is both. We've got old buildings we've retrofitted. We've got new buildings, both infrastructure costs and what we've had to do with it, and they ask about the maintenance costs. Well, we really don't have any maintenance costs on the central loose. It's all high-density polyethylene. I got pump bearings that may go out and so forth. There's not much behind this for the central loop when you stop and think about this. So I've got two guys that are specializing in this that run this whole program, 24 hours a day, 365 days a week. And then here's what I think is missing. <laughs> and I, I'm going to ask you to help me with this because we want to turn around and find out what other information is pertinent and what other information we need to form a national database of these systems so we can start to distribute and look at what our costs are, what they should be, what the metrics are, and how we can cure them. We also need to follow up and do something that mechanical engineers generally don't do. We need to follow our systems. These systems are living, they're dynamic, and they change every day in every application. Think of moving 20,000 students around the campus. Every minute my system changes. I can't just abandon it. I have to do that. I have to help with the control system. We have to turn around and look at that, be advisories to the, uh, to the uh, owners and so forth about how they control it. It doesn't ask anywhere how the system is controlled. It doesn't have an overlay system, such as a train safe or Johnson Metasys or whatever have you, and, so, and does, it, does that control system control the whole thing, including the buildings, or are the buildings controlled separately? So as I put this list up, and I hope you have a, 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 a you know, that your, your patrons have it, so we go through that. Anyway. That's pretty much what I have to say and introduce and, and, and go through that. I'll turn it over. Who am I supposed to turn it over to? I think you have the recommendation slide, right? Well, oh yeah, I guess, well, <laughs> I do have this. I can't read it. Design the system to be expandable and link it to other mm -hmm. microdistics. That's the, probably the most important thing right, right off the bat. Put a stub out in so you can take the system because the larger they get, the more stable they get. The more diverse they get, the more stable they get. The higher the efficiency. We actually have system coefficients of performance that are higher than any of the boxes because we move so much energy with just pump power. And that's the key to these systems. We can cut. We're talking about about a million and a half dollars energy savings on just these 17 buildings. 
annually. That means that I've got less than a 10-year payout. Somebody asked in the last session about the ROI. Estimate the system diversity, but plan for the peaks. You have to still plan for the peaks, but we need to run the system on that. What we have is we're running at part load, less than 50%, over 8,000 hours a year. For the other 750, 60 hours, I can afford a backup system. And I can use it. And I will decarbonize almost 100%. And if I, in this system, by the way, has not fired a boiler since 2012, except to turn and put the, uh, uh, the touch on the finishing or the legionella touch on the water to get it up to 140 degrees. When we start adding CO2 heat pumps, that gas will go away as well. And we need to track the circulating volumes and temperatures. That's really all you have to do with these systems. You can see how they're operating in plan for it. And remember, that it takes four hours for a drop of water to start out and make it all around, way around my system. So time becomes a factor, which is unusual. So, it's, uh, so, so thank you. Thanks so much, Kerry. We appreciate your wonderful expertise. Next up, we have Brian from Salas O'Brien. I got my name. Thanks, Kerry and uh, and Zainab and everybody. Appreciate the the time and being on the panel. And I 100 percent agree. Data is really critical, and I'm going to be the 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 bad case study. And what I'm going to show you on why we need debt data. Um, I really think there's three data sets. The first data set that we need in this industry is the project data, right? We need, we need a map. We need to know where all these systems are at, how big they are, what they cost, how they're operating. You know, uh, That's really important. Maryland actually had a website back, and I think it's still around, but they had every residential geothermal heat pump on a state website mapped. That needs to be the whole industry. We need to know not just residential. We need to know where all these are because we're the, we're the technology in the ground that you can't see. So we have no idea where these are at. Second set of data we need is operational data. We need to know how to operate these systems, especially the U10s or the uh, ambient loop systems. These are relatively new. We're already seeing the, sh the project I'm going to show you. They're very confused on how to operate the system. And it's th all you're turning on is pumps. But to, to keep the temperature profile and balance and all this, so we can share this information if we had it to help other people learn how, what is the best way to operate these systems? And it can become more plug and play. Okay, the third data set is the end use consumer set, right? We need to know the metrics of how is this benefiting society, the consumer, you know, environment. We don't have that information. And we're not tracking that information site by site, project by project. And those are really important metrics because we know we're not going to get anywhere unless we can show it to our legislators and the regulatory bodies this is the impact we're having. So I'm going to get into the project, and this is a case of we don't track any data. We have no data because it's a private corporation. They don't share their data. And so this system has been in operation now for a year and a half. It's the first of its kind in North America. It's a single pipe ambient loop connected to currently 250 homes. The full build out will be 312. They'll be done with all the homes at the end of this year. Uh, it's over a million square feet. 80% uh, reduction in carbon, you know, uh, it's 100% geothermal, no backup, no auxiliary heat, no boilers. All these homes are, are interconnected to 11 small pods of vertical ground loops scattered throughout the development with all the pumps and the infrastructure in the right of way in the street. But the utility company that's operating it, the energy company, is struggling to operate the system. And it's funny, with 250 homes, only nine of the 11 vertical ground loops are even on and all the pumps have been running at minimum speed and they were running at about 38 degrees this winter at the minimum and they thought they had a problem and they're calling us we got a problem why is the temperature at 38 what happens when we get to 312 homes well you haven't even turned all your pumps on and you're running at minimum speed <laughs> i have access to their it's it's all cloud-based so i can log in and look at the system and i can't change any parameters but i can look at it 
I'm like, we got three ground loops that are off. Turn them on. It'll go back up to 42 or, you know. So just education and having, you know, uh, a better way to really understand how to operate these systems because they are unique. They're new. This isn't like running just a central plant or which a lot of these district companies understand. This is totally different, okay? So this is in Markham, Ontario. Um, this is just a high-level schematic of what a single pipe ambient is. You have distributed uh, loads, homes, on, on a one-pipe network, and then you have distributed sources. And you put those sources in strategic places to keep that single pipe kind of in balance. Now, even if it's all residential, you don't have a lot of simultaneous heating and cooling, you don't have a lot of diversity, you can still make this work. It just takes a little more energy source. And those energy sources can be multi-source. It doesn't all have to be ground loops, right? You could actually have a sewage heat recovery in one portion. You could have a surface body of water on, for one source. That's the beauty of the single pipe. This particular project didn't have any of those. Well, they actually did have those resources. We studied it. All those resources went away, and they opted for all vertical ground loops because of all the red tape they had to get through to get to the, to the water and to open loop and some of their other uh, ideas that they initially had. So here's a little bit about the project. Again, I've already mentioned this. There's 650 tons roughly of capacity out of the 312 homes. They're all single family. Uh, there, there's some townhomes and connected homes, but they're all single family. Um, 500,000 square feet. Uh, like I said, it's been in operation for about a year and a half. They're gonna be, they just made it through their first full winter. Uh, and again, that's where they were kind of freaking out about 38 degrees. You know, normal geothermal systems, that's a, when your ground's only 53, that's a pretty good temperature in the middle of February, you know, but they, they really just didn't quite understand. Um, there is glycol in the system. There's, there's basically two miles of six inch pipe that interconnect all the homes. And so there's 15 total pumps in the system, 11 for the vertical loops and then four for resiliency and for um, phasing. Originally it was gonna be a phase project so we were gonna put a pump and, and kind of do it in sections. That turns out that they, they built it all at once, but those four pumps now with some bypasses are actually resilient. So if they're putting in fiber optics one day, they hit a section of pipe. You can actually shut off one quarter of the system and keep running three quarters of the system. So not the whole thing isn't down, you know, for these homeowners. Um, but we are running glycol because it is residential, it is heating dominant, and so we needed antifreeze in the system. And again, back to the volume, uh, conversation is when you have that much mass it's amazing how long it takes for that temperature to change and, uh, and but there's a lot of volume in the system so that that is a large cost and um, you know if you can keep it pure water obviously that's better but uh, typically with all residential and northern climates that's not feasible okay and the infrastructure cost was about 12 million dollars Canadian um, to do just the infrastructure. Now the energy company that owns this system actually owns everything all the way up and including the heat pump. In Canada, that's very common for them to own water heaters, heat pumps, and it's a lease program. And for that energy service company, that was the only way they really could make the financials work out for them to, to pencil out was to actually own all the equipment. And when it come to maintenance, the infrastructure itself, there's no maintenance. There, all the pumps are direct drive, no bearings, no greasing. Uh, everything is automatic feed on any water um, uh, makeup if any burst to bleed out of any of the air elimination. And uh, so basically they have air filters at the heat pumps. That's it. That's the maintenance. So they were worried about, you know, because all their infrastructure is in the street. You got to pop a manhole cover, go down into the vault to service a pump. But, you know, so they were worried about where these were located, access to the road and so forth. And it turns out they haven't opened those since they've started it. Since they flushed and filled it and you know, got it all started, they haven't been back in them. It's been a year and a half. So very, very little maintenance. It's really more on the heat pump side. You get your air filters and so forth. So that's the project, but I really want to point out that the data, we would love to get the data on not only the operation, the annual energy, we want to get the consumer side. How much are they really saving, okay? Um, you know, what's the carbon metrics look like? What is, from a utility perspective, what has it done to the, to the peak demands? Those are the things that we don't have that we'd love to have on the system because this is, this is the pilot. There hasn't been anything like this. And if we're gonna do more of these U10s, we need to look to this. Maybe we can convince N-Wave to, let's start gathering this information. Let's start tracking this. Let's really dive into it and learn from this so we can operate these better in the future. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Brian. Yeah, so we just heard from two installs that are in the ground, and now we're going to hear from two that will be soon. I actually have Bill next. <laughs> Mitch, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> I was all excited. You're, you are very excited. <laughs> um, yeah, so... So Bill and Mitch will give the perspective of what are they proposing to collect in terms of, of data and um, what, what are they looking to have, what kind of learnings are they looking to have. And um, we're, we'll get into some of the uh, outcomes and metrics a little bit later, Brian, so hold on to those ideas. So Bill, take it away. Okay. When I hit next or something. Yeah, so you can just do space bar or this area. Gotcha, you got it. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. Good morning, or afternoon, almost. Um, my name is Bill Beatty. I work for Orange and Rockland Utilities, um, which probably most of you know. But if not, they are located in southeastern New York. We serve uh, 309,000 electric customers, 140,000 gas customers in uh, Orange, Rockland, and Sullivan County. We also serve New Jersey, about 70,000 electric customers. Uh, I am a project specialist in the Utility of the Future Department. Um, Orange and Rockland is a subsidiary of Con Ed Inc. We, um, we've been collaboratively working with the Con Ed team. Greg, you may have heard him, he was here yesterday. Um, I have only been with Orange and Rockland for a year. Um, Prior to that, I spent 35 years as the director of operations for a municipal water, electric, and sewer utility in New Jersey. Uh, I'm hopeful, uh, I am not familiar that much with geothermal, but I'm hoping my experience in operating the water system will help us transition for the uh, utility thermal network. Um, I was very much hands-on involved with the SCADA system design, programming, installation, implementation, distributed control systems, PLCs, et cetera. So I'm kind of looking forward to that aspect of, of, the, uh, of the U10. Um, so as far as Orange and Rockland's uh, concerned, we are um, presently, as required under the Utility Thermal Energy and Network and Jobs Act, we are um, in the process of trying to develop a, a pilot project. We, we went out to many municipalities, had conversations, developers, and then in January of this year, we issued an RFI to, to have kind of a transparent process to locate sites. Um, and we presently have a site in mind, and we're having conversations mm -hmm. with the stakeholders, um, and we are hopeful to be submitting a supplemental filing with the PSC in uh, mid-May, along with uh, Con Ed to provide more details of our project. Um, and so I really can't get into the details of this, so I have more like a representative project. And one other thing to note, Brian Erlob is a member of our uh, project team helping ONR develop our uh, pilot. Been very, uh, it's been, been great. So that's just my background. So this is just a representative um, one-line diagram. You've seen it all. But our, our pilots, we were looking actually to do two pilots in our RFI. One mainly geared towards a new development, and the other more of a retrofit with main anchor customers. That, um, so we have located uh, through the RFI a potential site, and we're, we're hopeful, and at this community, we're actually thinking about doing two loops that are separate, and one will kind of satisfy the new, um, the new development top, you know, idea, and the other more of the retrofit idea. And then we're also going to keep in mind the potential to expand it in the future. And again, um, so that's, that's what we're working on. So, um, and this kind of represents what we're, you know, typical townhomes would be included, um, some residential mixed use, an industrial building, um, and um, we are also at this particular site, there, there, um, there is the potential of using surface water as a thermal source and also sewer. There's a forced main, and we're hoping that we can take advantage of that, a forced, uh, uh, you know, pretty sizable sewer main that we can potentially get thermal energy and then also boreholes. Uh, so this just is a summary of what we were looking for. Um, 
nothing really. It's it. I won't go into this detail. Um, as far as our metrics go, uh, data and metrics, um, we did file, you know, our proposed metrics in an earlier filing where we we're kind of given a, just a high level um, and, and a method of how we would get to our pilot with the commission. We've also had um, some meetings with PSC staff. I see them at the table here, and uh, we've we've gained some, you know, information and, and good suggestions. So at this point, we are. Um, we kind of broke it down into four categories. Technical, that's the system flow, the temperature, the bore field temperature, um, but some other things like rate of customer outages, duration of customer outages, duration of time the U10 will operate outside its temperature range, hopefully not often, um, outside of minimum flow. And again, hopefully that doesn't happen often, but um, these are just some of the ideas that we were um, also asset tracking, you know, the, the, the sizes of the pipes, the materials, age, uh, et cetera. And then financial, you know, this one's kind of important, the customer billing impact of U10 compared to previous energy costs. We're hoping to use historical, you know, we, we have ONRs um, pretty well set up with interval um, metering both on the gas and the electric side. So we have historical data and we can compare it to when we get them up and running, you know, what, what is the, the impact. Um, cost impacts, they are operating expenses to require to run and balance it, capital per customer, BTU, et cetera. Um, And, uh, you know, we're hoping, uh, you know, we, we may have to, for some customers, do some energy efficiency upgrades, and we want to kind of be able to see the impact of maybe a building that did upgrades versus one that didn't. And moving on, customer, um, some, some, of these, some of these kind of came out of our discussions with the PSC staff, customer satisfaction surveys, once it gets up and running, call center queries, um, customers exiting or entering the pilot after construction complete, tracking of energy efficiency, upgrades to the U10, um, and again, total energy use peak, et cetera. Um, one, one minute warning. Bill. Gotcha. And the last is safety, um, OSHA incident rate, contractor excavation damages, facility failure, equipment failures, excavation damages, emergency response, and you know, greenhouse gas reduction, emissions reductions, and jobs impacts. So these are the things we're looking for. So I will complete. My well, one last comment I wanna make, and just thank you all. This is a great conference. I, I, I wish I could be in four places at once. I've learned a lot at this conference, and uh, I really appreciate it. So thank you, thank you everyone. Thanks so much, Bill. So I think what we're displaying here is the range, right, of what the installs really look like. Uh, the ones that are in the ground, the one that's been running for a year and a half. Um, Carrie's, yours has been since what, 2007? Well, the first one put in since 2002. 2002. Um, and now we have a wave of a lot of people trying to install this technology. Um, and we need to transfer those learnings. And so, Mitch, you're our last speaker, and then we're gonna talk a little bit more about outcomes, metrics, and turn it over to the audience, so get ready to, to move, to participate, guys. And Rachel, if you wanna start handing out those sheets, that would be awesome. If you have a pen, pull it out, get ready, guys. Mitch, take it away. Yeah. So go fast, I get it. <laughs> And I'm finally able to come up and uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak, and I'm, I'm blessed to, uh, to be on a panel with uh, some, some folks that have uh, a great kind of history, a great background in doing these projects. Um, I'm honored to be a part of this panel, so uh, I'm going to jump into this and be as quick as I can uh, and get to Q&A. So I'm Mitch DeWine. I'm with CHA Consulting. We're a consulting engineering firm. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our City of Troy project. Uh, there's been a lot of panel discussions about it. I won't talk about the project a ton in detail. 
a uh, really quick overview of this piece. Uh, you can get kind of from the photo the context of scale of this. Uh, we're gonna really focus in on the top left of that, which is really the first phase project that we're looking to build out. Um, I'll, I'll dig into that one in some of the technical detail uh, and then get to what we're looking to, uh, to get from data perspective outside. Uh, first phase, uh, we have uh, roughly five or six phases that we've contemplated as part of the project. Uh, and you know it scales up from one to uh, to you know several kind of pockets of the community. Um, the the bottom right is a kind of a cartoon diagram that shows the various system components. Um, the the piece outlined in blue would be owned by the municipality uh, through its LEC. Uh, the red by a third party uh, supporting as the distribution utility, uh, and then the green on the customer side or or the owner side uh, utility side. Um, so the initial phase, uh, roughly a 600 ton system connected, uh, that scales up in the overall project to somewhere between five to 8,000 tons, really depending on to uh, development uptick. Um, you know, we're, we're broken out as I showed in the diagram, there's multiple system owners, there's uh, a number of folks that are involved in this that are kind of sharing the, uh, the load, the burden of kind of cost and in, in, in integration into the system. Uh, very similar, uh, we actually, because of the way that the system is going to be built as utility in phase in of customer uh, acquisition, we're not confident in timeline and whether heating or cooling dominant or balanced, so therefore we're running in a glycol configuration in this system. Um, we have some considerations for backup thermal sources, but those are still being finalized. Uh, we have a really good mix of old building stock, new building stock. Uh, some buildings are being retrofitted, some already have heat pumps in them. Uh, we were, we were uh, benefited by the ability to direct connect to some of those. Um, and you know, on an operational cost standpoint, you know, we we threw a placeholder as kind of the life cycle annual operational costs are very low. Uh, really, just maintaining pumps in the systems as we're focused uh, in what I've presented here, mostly on the actual utility system itself. Um, so I'm going to jump right into it. What do we wish we had? What do we? What data do we think is super important? Um, I had kind of a sense uh, from who the rest of the panelists were, what they were going to talk about from a technical side, I fully agree in all the technical data absolutely needs to be tracked, shared. Uh, the community at large really needs to know it, but I'm also very interested in the business model, the business case, the financial configurations that make these systems work. Um, technically, I think we've heard from everybody we can make these systems work. We've seen them uh, work uh, and, and we know that the, uh, the application is uh, super flexible uh, at the end of the day, the, the business model is really what's going to drive adoption at scale, right? And so um, di I've been in district energy and energy efficiency basically my whole career. The one barrier to uh, rapid adoption is uh, ends up being us in the industry in many cases, right? We're, uh, we want to hold on to the thing that's going to put us at a competitive advantage above the rest, right? We, we need to do a better job of sharing what models actually make things work out, uh, the, and particularly, I think, in this case, the financial models, how you share those costs, um, how you work with customer acquisition. There's, you know, we talked a lot about um, in many of the presentations we've given on this Troy project about the messaging to the prospective customer base. You know, every customer is going to have a different motivation and is going to be encouraged to connect to a system kind of from a different angle, and, and so those kind of conversations are, are very important, um, and, and uh, approaches to how that might be able to be accomplished. Um, and then, you know, the, the, you know again, what, what the contracts look like between the various parties, um, and, and getting sort of those final financial case, uh, case studies really proven and shown to the, the industry so that we can scale up uh, at, at large, so. How did I do for time? <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I appreciate your, your attention. Awesome. So I had these rapid fire questions, but I think I'm going to leave them to the end. We're going to come back to these for the panelists, and we're going to open it up to the room instead. So um, I'm going to first ask the new installs. Um, and Eric is going to come up and put up another Slido poll. If you were here in the last session, you know what that is. But 
we're actually going to have you scan with your phone um, and answer some of the questions that come on screen. Eric, do you want to do that? If you want to maybe transfer over to the new installs. So Mitch and Bill, what outcomes are important to you and your company to evaluate your future system? To evaluate your future system. Outcomes for evaluation. And then everyone in the audience. What would you consider a successful That's, installation? Okay. What outcomes would you like to see? I have some examples. Affordability, equity, others? <laughs> okay, to me, most importantly is like customer satisfaction. Uh, hopefully both the commercial and the residential customers are satisfied with the results. Um, obviously, you know, cost, savings, energy savings, um, it would be good. And then, and then from an operational standpoint, you know, I'm hoping everything is thought through thoroughly and the system operates, you know, with minimal, um, you know, maintenance and, uh, you know, requirements on that end. So that's my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I'll just add from a technical success standpoint, as engineers, we all want our systems to be um, operational, have high uptimes, you know, meet the needs, uh, heating, cooling needs of the customers that we're trying to connect to. I think scale, uh, particularly for Troy, being able to take the model and scale it up is very important. Uh, we're really starting off in a small pocket very intentionally, not wanting to uh, uh, really bite off more than we, we think we can use as a really strong case study to, uh, to prove to kind of the greater community that scale is, uh, that the, the model works and that we want to scale that model up for the greater community. Beautiful. I'm going to go ahead and read off some of the ones that you all have um, thrown into Slido, because I think they're really good. Um, let me open this up. Creates community sense. Energy reduction. No backup resistant heating and designs. That it works. <laughs> Tracking industry growth, energy cost reduction, final consumer awareness slash education buying, predictability, success. Yeah, we want success. Reliability, I think that's a big one. Um, large scale adoption. Let's see, a lot of repeats. I like the money, money, money one, that was funny. <laughs> Uh, greenhouse gas reduction, ease of maintenance, data on how the system is performing against the model. I think you're talking about the digital twin. Zainab, do you want to give a quick shout out? It wasn't me, despite your assumption. Uh, but I, I think that uh, one thing we should mention is uh, that there's a bunch of engagement from a research team with national labs, including Dr. Liu, uh, who's joined us today, uh, to build a, what you could call a digital twin or um, a replication of some of the first installs going in the ground, and then use the data coming off of them to uh, improve the model, refine the model, um, and then make it open source to all of us to move the industry forward. So uh, that's a really exciting aspect of what we can do with the data coming off of the first installs. Uh, is that what you wanted me to add, Angie? Yes. Absolutely. And so now that we've all heard a little bit of the outcomes that, that the new folks want to see, and then we've gotten some feedback from everybody in the room, given those outcomes, what metrics do you want to see measured? Right? So let's get a little bit more granular. Everybody in Slido. So now I'm turning it to you all. What metrics should be measured? Uh, Carrie and Brian. Well, I'm gonna agree with Bill. I think uh, really customer satisfaction surveys are very important. I think when you're out 
looking at converting these neighborhoods and, and communities to, to U-10s, there is some hesitancy for people to retrofit their homes and give up gas. And so uh, I think if they saw a lot of the satisfaction that all these other people that have converted or been living with geothermal for some time, they could see the increased comfort, the resiliency, the, the you know, um, that the systems don't break down very often, there's very little maintenance, I think that would help the adoption from, from that perspective. You'd have less resistance for those people to want to be part of these projects. So I think that's one metric that really needs to be shared and, and gathered and put in one place. The, uh, you know, this is a holistic operation and it's got to be live and it's got to be dynamic. And we can't, as Brian said, you know, we've got to be able to look at this. We've got to be able to analyze it. We've got to be able to change it. We've got to be able to expand it. And when we talk about this, uh, the U.S. Uh, on NRAIL and several people have started to call this a 5G system. What we're talking about is we've already started to take this to 6G. And the 6G includes customer satisfaction, has to include all of those metrics that make this dynamic and workable uh, uh, input. So we're looking at working on 6G. You guys are, you know, you still don't absorb in 5G. <laughs> we want to look at it. But I agree that uh, we've got to have all of this data, all of it present, and, and, and you know. In one place. In one place. And that holistic has to be, uh, system has to be satisfied. Great. All right. So does anyone, there's a lot of good metrics that the audience is, I know there's a lot of data people in here. Does anyone want to volunteer to talk about one of the, the metrics that they've thrown on the screen? Anybody at all? Not everybody at once. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm Jen Livermore. I'm a contractor with the Department of Energy Geothermal Technologies Office, and a lot of this conversation resonates with some of the active projects that we're working with the National Lab Complex on. So when thinking about what metrics that we want to see measured, I think the, you know, the comments about wanting to have a centralized repository, national database with performance information, with the location of systems, all of that would be lovely to have. We do have an active project going with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory where they are going to be updating their interim market report. Um, the previous market report that was published in 2021 did not have much information about geothermal heat pumps. It only included information about district heating systems. So we're looking to update that with the district cooling systems, um, geothermal heat pumps more broadly and trying to create a better inventory of the types of systems and capacities and performance information that that we all, you know, that we have within the, the US. So any suggestions from folks about how we could better obtain and collect these types of information? Um, that's a very much an ongoing topic of conversation and we need industry's help. Thank you for all you're doing. Can, and can I say something about that? Just oh, real yeah. quick, if you don't mind. So. All the manufacturers that are building these heat pumps today, almost all of them, if not all of them, have cloud-based technology that all their data can be dumped to a cloud. And so I think working with manufacturers, because obviously the heat pump is where it is, and it can give you all the data that it's operating at, it and it's all right there. We just have to have some kind of an agreement that that data is kept private, but at some level can get at least metrics. And you could gather, I mean, at least starting now with the new technology, new installations, it's hard to go back, but they have the ability to, to track, trend, store, you know, uh, data dump all this information now because they're all connected. It's just uh, a matter of finding that database, who's gonna, you know, manage it, all that kind of stuff. And obviously you have to have some legal, you know, implications there with privacy, but. I'm going to comment on that too in the sense that I think that uh, tied to these incentives that are being given by the federal government ought to be the mandate that that data be shared. Oh, yes. <laughs> can, can I add to that, Carrie, that, you know, 
the, the project I mentioned earlier, the Learning from the Ground Up project, is um, working with Eversource Gas and National Grid in Massachusetts to use the data to inform those models that the national labs are building. And part of that is in part because our legislature and our utility commission really want to learn and also all of the willingness of all parties. And I, I want to ask New York, how about it? <laughs> so join in along with the federal government. Now there was a person over here and I, who wanted to had a question or a comment. Yes. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jason Masters. I'm uh, the energy lead for Borough Happold. Brian, my question was for you. On the, the system that you guys have running, it, I understand that N-Wave is, uh, is the, the EAS provider, basically. That's correct. Are they thir did they third-party contract the operation? And is that the, 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 is that the point of, of problem where a third-party contractor has to report through N-Wave so that you guys can get the information back? Because I came from the federal government, and that's, that's primarily the biggest hitch between uh, uh, ESPC contracts and successful UESC contracts. So that, uh, that's... Yeah, that's not really the case there. They are okay. actually operating it themselves. Um, now, they're not doing the maintenance. They are doing, especially on the heat pumps, they've third-partied the, the maintenance contract of, of the heat pumps. But the infrastructure itself, they're operating in-house because they operate district systems all the time. Uh, I think the disconnect is that they're not really taking the data. They keep trying to reference back to the model. And it's like, your model is the system that's operating. That's the model. Take the data from that and start analyzing it. <laughs> Instead, they keep going back to, well, here's what we modeled. C can you tell me what's different? <laughs> OK, well, we can look at that, but that doesn't really going to help you. Um, but so I don't, I think it's just internal training of what do we need to know and what do we do with it? And I, I think that's really where the disconnect is. But they, they can get the data. They're operating it themselves. So it's really just an internal issue, I think. Thank you. All right. So I just want to know, is there more? Yeah, come on. <laughs> um, I'm just going to say, this is the beginning of a much larger conversation. We're collecting these metrics, we're collecting the outcomes, and we're, all, we're gonna host it on an open source site. I think I mentioned it before, Gas to Geo Wiki. Anybody can collaborate, it's free to use. Um, we're gonna put all of this information up there. Let's keep talking. Um, but Jared, go ahead. Um, hey, Jared Rodriguez. Uh, so in a network system, how or what data do we need to mimic location-based marginal pricing in order to properly dispatch thermal resources? Do you understand what my question is? I'm, I'm curious to hear what the response would be. <laughs> I, I'm assuming you're talking about like spot energy pricing. And, uh, right. I mean, yeah, How okay. can we value the heat in the network on a time basis so that we can affect behavior either on the supply side or on the consumption side? Good question. <laughs> to be determined, but I mean, obviously, energy data, maybe greenhouse gas emission data. Um, um, I'm not sure. You know. Go ahead, someone else, yeah. That's a moving target, Jared. Yeah. And, and again, it's part of the dynamic nature of the system. When we start talking and looking about collecting this type of data, we are moving into 6G, okay? And we just haven't grabbed that yet. Uh, I think you are really got something that we talked about way back, literally 10 years, 12 years ago. How do we turn around and collect this energy? When we have excess energy, can we do this? When Mesa State has all this excess energy that they're doing, in capacity they're do doing, why not market it to the high school next door? And I think that's really where you're going with that. But that's the concept of the district and linked district systems and why we would put them together. 
because as soon as we put that district, the next district system in, link the two with a trickle charge or however you decided to link it or open it up to full circulation, that's the point when that all the metrics and all the value comes to, to the head. And you're right, it's the, all about dollars and when you come down to it. And I think that this is one of those systems that has a kind of an unlimited scope for an annuity that will last for a thousand years. You know? Right, right. This, so this issue of like marginal costs, right? So there's like two things. There's the marginal cost of capacity, which is like hard cost projects. And then there's like that live yes. marginal pricing for the commodity that's flowing in the pipe. Yes, yeah, so that's yeah. an unintended consequence of what we're doing. And yeah. uh, like before they were uh, kind of villainized, all of our unintended consequences for these loops have been positive so far. Yeah. And that is scary. It's really scary. Uh, well, now that we've begun the conversation about building a thermal market, uh, <laughs> I'm going to turn it back to Angie. Yeah, sure. Um, I actually had a question for the panelists. Is there a key metric or data point that can be misleading? I should have probably sent that to you ahead of time. <laughs> People in the audience are also welcome to comment on that one. I think Dave has something oh, to say. Okay. Oh, Zainab. Into the mic so we can record it, please. From the utility perspective, we're really concerned mostly about the peaks. So average, like annual averages are less important than peak demand. Um, and so uh, lots of people talk about, oh, the, a the average annual, this and that. It's um, really, for the, from the utility side, um, the peaks are a lot more important. Uh, David, since you're from Excel and you helped us get the center, this uh, information, I'm going to make a positive. I think you know the answer. When we looked at CMU and we expanded from 800,000 square feet to do a million two square feet, and we're watching the dynamics of the system, Excel brought to us a demand chart, and they wanted to know what we did. And they couldn't figure out. What happened was, is over the three years and the 50% expansion of the system, we managed to maintain a one megawatt data one megawatt window, uh, sort of some outliers, you know, that had to do with the school opening or whatever have you. And the real reason we started looking at that was to see if CHP was applicable, and if we could turn around and take care of peaking and so forth. But we discovered that you know it's an excellent peaking device if operated correctly. And what we're finding out with our borehole research and our, sta our stability research is that we're probably not using the capacity of our fields to near the capacity we could. And it's because how we put the energy in. We put it in too fast, expect it to do it. It's not going to move any faster than the diffusivity of the formation. I know that's technical, but it means that we can meter it and trickle charge it in forever or for a long time. And it will constantly take energy and constantly give energy. And you can find a rate at which that storage is actually moving back and forth at the same rate you're actually operating. And again, you gotta remember that these systems are dynamic. So if I make a change now, it might take four hours. And when the four hours happens, the event has been concluded. It's no longer peak. So if I can move that energy and just use pump energy, for example, instead of 700, 800 tons of, of, or I'm sorry, horsepower to run a bunch of cooling towers, I've just turned around a limited peak. I've limited my demand. Now I have to figure out how to do it and keep it in that 15 minute window you guys have. So I'll, th I'll throw just a really quick, um, I'm, I'm thinking every data point can be misleading if the person who is reading the data is not educated enough on the system to understand what the data point is. Brian gave a great example earlier, 38 degrees, what's going wrong with my system? And the, mm -hmm. the point is they didn't understand their system. So I think the edu education is super important, um, especially to the people that are reading the data. 
my one, and I think this is mentioned before in this conference, one data point that may be misleading is if you add cooling to a home or, or a building that they didn't have cooling in the past, you know, they may see higher energy, but, you know, not realize that you know, part of it is the added cooling. So that's just obviously you need to be cognizant of that. Yeah, great point. Well, I'm supremely grateful to all of you um, and your expertise. I think that we need to continue the conversation online. I, you know, we did this little exercise where we all threw in outcomes, metrics. I'm gonna put something that looks something like this, a table on our wiki for everybody to collaborate on um, and to start that knowledge transfer. And you can talk to me. I will connect you with these people. <laughs> I will be bugging you guys. Um, and starting the process of creating a learning community um, in, in a centralized place. In many places, it doesn't have to be in the wiki. It can be in person. We can have more conferences and get together and talk. But I think the, the what, what we heard here today is that we need to continue um, to get together and talk. So with that, Zainab, so, you know, if you want to add anything, um, I just want to say thank you very much to everybody that participated here today. Thank you. And if you weren't here um, in the last session, at 6 p.m., we're signing our declaration of thermification. And there will be champagne. <laughs> <laughs> and gifts. Um, and I, if, as, as we're filtering out, I want to take a moment to thank Angie for an incredible job coordinating and I'm Mitchell. Her first, her first facilitation of a panel. Fantastic job.